of Association of uh, Auto Laryngologists of India, Delhi State. Uh, I welcome you to this forum. Uh, the purpose of this forum has been very specific to bring uh, high quality content in a very short format uh, and uh, from very eminent speakers, uh, both nationally as well as internationally. We had a very interesting lecture last week uh, by Professor Ziv Gill, in which he talked about the anatomy of the infratemporal fossa as well as uh, external approaches to the infratemporal fossa. This lecture was very well received and the feedback has been excellent. And uh, uh, we had a wonderful viewership on uh, YouTube channel also. And uh, for this week, uh, Ziv will be talking on uh, the minimal access approaches to the infratemporal fossa. And this is going to be the part two of a two lecture series. And uh, we have a packed, ac academically packed April. Uh, I'll be apprising you about the upcoming activities in the April, in the month of April by the AOI Delhi. I'll be talking about them uh, towards the end of uh, this lecture. And uh, with this, I hand over to Dr. H. Chitaneja, who is president of Association of Water Laring also of India and uh, for his introductory remarks. Thank you, Vipin. <clears throat> uh, today we are having continuation of infratemporal fossa approach. So this session will be chaired by our professor, Ernan Mathur, who is professor of excellence at Lady Harding Medical College, New Delhi. And another chairperson is Dr. Shami Chopra, very well-known name in the field of head and neck surgery. He is director of head and neck surgery, Patel Hospital at Jalandhar. So I hand over to the, our chairpersons, please. Good evening all. And uh, uh, we are very fortunate again today to have a lecture again by Professor Zeb Gill, who gave the lecture last week also on infratemporal fossa as a part one of his lecture. And today is the part two. Uh, the last lecture was so illustrious and uh, uh, with a uh, lot of um, uh, practical tips, uh, especially on how to raise the flaps and the anatomy related to it. And uh, I'm sure today's lecture will also be uh, as interesting as the last one. Uh, you all know, I don't have to repeat, but uh, just for the sake of uh, introduction, again, reintroduction, Professor Zivgal is the physician and the scientist and the head and neck surgeon at uh, Rambam Health Care Campus uh, uh, in Israel. And um, he's uh, both the neuroscientist, biophysicist, as well as the head and neck surgeon with the, uh, um, uh, with the um, attachments in the, uh, as a, in the technical university, as well as in the head and neck surgery, which fascinates me tremendously. I mean, uh, somehow this sort of an arrangement we should also have in India that uh, you are both the scientist as well as the clinician. Uh, with this, with these remarks, I hand over. Um, if Sumit, uh, would you like to say anything? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. At the outset, uh, thanks to Delhi AOI and to professors of excellence like yourself, sir, for giving us this opportunity to interact on such a stage. I, I share your words about uh, Professor Gill. I, I also must apologize because of some urgent operative commitment. I was not able to join you last time. Uh, Professor Gill, I uh, did manage to get a full link of your YouTube talk, thanks to Professor Vipin. And uh, we reviewed it. And it reminded me of not only the work that we do occasionally at my current center, but also my fellowship in open skull based surgery at the University of California for two years with Dr. Paul Donald. I, in fact, could, could uh, pick up some images uh, as a direct reflection of the infratemporal fossa and the middle cranial fossa approach that he that he so advocated. And again, your commentary was very elucidative. And uh, we look forward to your talk today. And let me not hold anyone else from the academic excellence. And uh, thank you again. And we'll have closing comments at the end, first from sir, and then hopefully from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. It's like uh, going back home again. Um, in this uh, session, I would like to emphasize the minimally invasive technique for the lateral skull base in general, which include also the infotemporal fossa, as you will see uh, in the next slides. 
So in general, our uh, approaches to the uh, skull base and uh, lateral skull base are generally through orifice of the nose, through orifice of the uh, mouth, or as we uh, recently developed in the last uh, 10 years, through endoscopic transcervical approaches. And this you see here, so that limits a little bit compared to the open approaches, but still you will see that there's a large variability of possibilities and approaches that we can do with a many, minimally invasive uh, surgeon. To show you, this is uh, our uh, uh, endoscopic suite at the institution. Uh, usually we perform the operation uh, with two surgeons technique. As also uh, in the institution, there is the robotic, the Da Vinci robotic uh, apparatus, which also many of you are familiar with, which we combined also for removal of tumors, not only in the uh, base of tongue, uh, or pharynx, larynx, but also in the scalpis, as you uh, will, recent, will, will soon see. Uh, this is to show you that many of the approaches that I will talk about are published in this book. Any of you that is interested in receiving the PDF of this book, uh, this is my email. You can feel free to contact me and I will send you a copy uh, of the book in a PDF approach. This is from the book. You see here a wonderful uh, images from uh, Al Roton's uh, chapter, uh, specifically in the infratemporal fossa, but I will not go into details of the anatomy since I've done that uh, in my last uh, lecture. Let me start with a general clinician, uh, clinical workup with, of these tumors which start with imaging. Imaging, as you all know, can be CT, MRI, and variation of these images. That will give you the anatomy, and that will create the initial differential diagnosis for the potential pathology, which starts with imaging. The imaging, as you know, gives you hints about what could be the pathology in general, malignant uh, or uh, benign, and within these groups, what kind of pathology is this? When we translate the imaging into surgical uh, workup, to be prepared to the operation, we specifically look at the, inter, uh, the uh, internal carotid artery. Uh, and as you can see here, this is an anomaly of the internal carotid artery. That you can see a, a aneurysm of uh, the internal carotid artery in the right of a stesoneuroblastoma, a patient with a stesoneuroblastoma, just, just to give you an example. Uh, for what you look for in the imaging before you perform the surgery. Pathology evaluation of this tumor is very crucial because in general, in the best centers, pathology may be wrong in 30% of the cases. Uh, we know that from publication and we know that from our day-to-day -day practice we know that from cases that we evaluated years later and we see that the initial pathology is wrong. Um, in some cases, as you know, pathology is not feasible at all. For example, highly vascular tumors or intracranial tumors, which are very difficult to access for pathology. So full assessment is based Number one on the clinical evaluation, physical examination and assessment, radiological evaluation, pathological evaluation and molecular evaluation. So you have to group all them together to see if they're connected, if the agreement between the four parts of the full assessment, if there's no agreement, you should go and ask for revision revision of the radiology, go back to the patient, revision the clinical evaluation, ask for another pathological assessment in another institution and for more molecular patho uh, pathological evaluation. In these tumors in the skull base, the, uh, the pathological assessment is mainly based solely on immunohistochemistry and molecular evaluations. 
but a biopsy is crucial. So if, when you see tumor like this, and you think, let's try to remove that when we do an endoscopic approach, that may be wrong because this is a case of the of lymphoma, for example, and any surgery is not needed and useless in this case. So a simple biopsy uh, in the clinic is enough to treat this patient. Surgery is not part of the management of this patient. We should bear in mind that there are few cases, few tumors that a biopsy may create seeding. It's very rare in the head and neck, but in this, this case of a chordoma, you can see here seeding at the nasal cavity from a biopsy that was done uh, several months before through the nostril. Also, just to give you one example for this case, it's a, it's a young uh, child with young sarcoma. The diagnosis is made by a, a chromosomal analysis or now molecular kits for chromosomal translocation 11-22. Tailoring, tailoring of treatment, as we spoke last week, is based on tumor factor and patient factor. About surgeon factor, in this case, everyone should evaluate whether the, he has the right expertise and the right knowledge to perform these surgeries because for minimally invasive surgery, you, only, or, you not only need uh, the uh, surgical expertise, but also the experience uh, of doing this. And, all, and every one of you should evaluate it whether he is the right, the, his center is the right uh, center to do that, or uh, the patient should be referred to another surgeon that happens to everybody, every one of us. So the first question needs to be asked before decision regarding the type of surgery is what is the goal of operation? Goal of operation should be Q, could be Q, palliation or quality of life. Second goal is margins. As you see here from a patient that we published several years, uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, this is for all skull-based sarcoma, margins are crucial factor for a, a prognosis in these patients. For example, you can see here, this case, you can see the MRI in the right of the left. This is a sinonasal a snack, sinonasal undifferentiated carcinoma. Surgery here, the chance of reaching negative margin, in my opinion, is completely zero. So in this case, anyone should assess whether surgery need to be the first goal of treatment or other modalities such as chemotherapy and radiation, radiation therapy, which, is, which are options in undifferentiated carcinoma and SNAP. What are surgical limits when we use endoscopic approach? Obviously, skin involvement, frontal sinus, lateral or superior that cannot be accessed through our endoscopic tools, optic nerves, infiltration of the orbit, which we still cannot perform orbital exenteration, and we will not be able to perform orbital exenteration endoscopically, internal carotid artery, and down hypoglossal canal. This is an example for fibrous dysplasia. You can see here the lateral extension of the tumor, obviously that we can only reach endoscopically up to the mid pupillary line, lateral to this, we will not be able to perform a surgery. So most likely we will not access this tumor through an endoscopic approach, but rather than open approach alone. What about the anterior wall of the maxilla? You can see here that the anterior wall of the maxilla is infiltrated and that the tumor is uh, infiltrating through the soft tissue, through the bone into the soft tissue of the nostril. In this case, this is not a, a, a good case for endoscopic surgery, although if the tumor is only involving the anterior wall of the maxilla, we can perform a Dunker operation, which you can see here, removal endoscopically of the anterior wall of the maxilla. And here you can see very nice access laterally 
uh, to the lateral wall of the maxilla and to the posterior wall of the maxilla. And uh, behind this, as you will see later on, behind the posterior wall, we have the pterygopalatine fossa, infratemporal fossa, and parapharyngeal space. What about the carotid artery? The carotid artery is an important and a crucial structure for planning of surgery. You can see here uh, from anterior endoscopic view of the carotid artery on the left and on the right. So you can see here we can have an access both medial and lateral to the carotid artery. We soon see how we can find the carotid artery. And you can see here <clears throat> the nice anatomical landmarks uh, uh, around the carotid artery that you are familiar with. with this is the maxillary sinus, so all the area behind the maxillary sinus is pretty much accessible up to the level of the uh, carotid artery. <coughs> Sorry. This is a very important example about the uh, anatomical location of the internal carotid artery and the feasibility of suture. This is a chordoma, which, which extends to the clivus and to the infratemporal fossa. But the problem with the case, with this case, is that the tumor is completely shadowed, completely blocked by the right and left carotid artery. So any, and you can see here also in a lower uh, um, slice. So pretty much all the area behind the internal carotid artery is shadowed and is blocked for any endoscopic where is lateral or medial to the carotid artery, it's blocked by the artery. So in this case, endoscopic approach is not feasible and we would prefer to perform a, an open approach, lateral approach, most likely, whether it's from one side or both sides, this is later on for, it's beyond the scope of the talk. Massive infiltration of the infratemporal fossa and massive infiltration of the dura are also a contraindication in, in my opinion for endoscopic resection. We talked about orbital apex uh, and orbital infiltration in this example. You can see here, we could approach the tumor and remove the, the uh, tumor endonasally, but because the orbit is infiltrated, the patient needs to undergo orbital exenteration and therefore endoscopic approach is not feasible. Superior limits, this is a case of dead differentiated carcinoma that we operated on. So superior limits here up to the lateral ventricle completely uh, encompass the uh, third ventricle. This is a huge tumor that will be very difficult with our endoscopic tools to remove endoscopically. And therefore we, because also of the approximation to the in, in encasement of the carotid artery on the left side, this would be better in our hand approach through an um, open approach if it's a, a surgical candidate at all. There will be uh, opinions uh, for a palliative therapy only in this case. This is a young case, 40 years old a patient with this type of tumor. The, uh, the, how far we can reach from below? we can define the lower uh, reach of the endoscopic approach, both laterally and posteriorly by the nasopalatine line. This is a line connecting the nasal bone and the palate, and we can extend it by drilling the palate and extend up to C2 and C3. This is individual case by case, case, case by case, but as a general rule, every one millimeter drilling of the hard palate will give you five millimeter inferior reach of the uh, uh, C spine. Relative and absolute contraindication, as you can see here, hardware, metal hardware, we cannot perform uh, endoscopic uh, approach in this situation of such as previously treated osteosarcoma. Massive involvement of the cavernous sinus, as in this tumor, you can see that we will only at the most be able to remove 50% of the tumor. Therefore, surgery is not of use 
to this patient and we will prefer other modalities rather than surgical modalities. Malignant melanoma, although we can remove T4 malignant melanoma many times, there is a question whether surgery is a modality for T4 melanoma. And you can see here from a previous uh, publish uh, at the Memorial Sloan Catering and uh, with us the comprehensive uh, skull base uh, um, uh, group that eventually all patients uh, with T4 melanoma will succumb for because of the disease within several months. And now we have also immunotherapy and other uh, BRAF inhibitors that we can uh, treat these patients. Therefore, we would be very reluctant to treat patients with T4 malignant melanoma of the paranasal sinuses uh, with surgery. Uh, this is an example for, for, for uh, rhabdomyosarcoma. You can see here an extension, big extension to the neck. So in this case, an endoscopic transcervical approach would be have to combine with an open approach from the infratemporal fossa, and therefore we would pre uh, prefer removing this tumor through a transcervical and uh, infratemporal approach and not use endoscopic approaches in this case. And obviously, me, me distance metastasis are contraindication. An exception for this is adenoid cystic carcinoma, because we've shown several years ago that patient with adenoid cystic carcinoma uh, can live with uh, distance metastasis. You can see here the metastasis rates for oral cavity, major salivary gland, paranasal sinuses, adenoid cystic carcinoma, and these patients can live for years and years with metastasis in the lung, uh, which can be treated with uh, um, radiosurgery if needed. So uh, we would uh, certainly um, prefer local control for adenoid cystic carcinoma or even uh, uh, when the patient has a uh, distance metastasis. Meningeal spread and massive brain involvement, as shown here, this is a very uh, dramatic ex example for a patient with stesinoblastoma, which is a contraindication for surgery. An important issue for endoscopic removal of tumors is the consistency of the tumor. This is an important fact that we have to take into consideration when we decide whether the patient should undergo endoscopic, minimally invasive, or open surgery. For example, this is a case of osteoma, and you can see here that the carotid artery is encased in this tumor. Drilling will be very hard and difficult endoscopically, uh, finding the internal carotid artery will be very difficult and risky, and therefore this patient would be better managed with a, an open approach. And this is an, 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 an important issue that we should discuss, is the consistency of the tumor. In general, suckable tumors such as some type of chordomas, pituitary adenomas, stesinoblastoma are more easily removed through an endoscopic approach using the two suction technique. Uh, suckable tumors can be removed completely, even if they are very close to the uh, nerves or to the internal carotid artery because of their consistency. Rubbery tumors in, such as chordomas, several chordomas, and chondrosarcoma, rubbery tumors are more difficult, difficult to remove. They need special uh, instruments like CUSA. Sometimes even CUSA will not be uh, feasible for removal of rubbery tumors, and you need uh, uh, hard uh, tools like carisons and scissors. Fibrous tumors are much more difficult to remove. They're removed usually with drills. 
with bear drills and therefore they are more dangerous and these uh, instruments are very uh, risky for use in these kind of tumors because of injury to the internal carotid artery. And I have a lecture about uh, catastrophic events in endoscopic surgery, part of them is injury to the internal carotid artery, and, of, oh, again, and obviously bony tumors, as I, I just uh, discussed before with this uh, osteoma. Uh, the operating setup for both transcervical or transnasal endoscopic approach will uh, include also uh, exposure of the uh, area for reconstruction. In this case, we will harvest fascia lata for reconstruction of the skull base. Two nostrils techniques, four hands, two surgeons. This is the preferred uh, instrument for tranasal endoscopy. And also for transcervical endoscopy, we almost always will work with two surgeons. Uh, sometimes it will be two ENT surgeons, sometimes it will be an ENT and a, a, a neurosurgeon. Instruments are standard. We use in all of our cases cranial nerve monitoring, somatory evoke potential, and special instruments, and obviously navigation. I will not go into details of the transnasal endoscopic approach because this is a different part, different beyond the scope of our talk but let's concentrate on the infratemporal fossa. You can see here from the, this uh, general anatomical uh, view that the infratemporal fossa in green, the trigopalatine fossa in blue, and the, tri the, the, uh, tri the uh, parapharyngeal space in red are very close one to another, and many times the tumor that are involving in this area will involve parts or several of these anatomical locations. This is a potential space which connects all these area together and depends at the tumor uh, origin and at the path of least resistance. So in general, tumors in the infratemporal fossa and parapharyngeal and trigopalatine fossa can be accessed endoscopically, either by a transmaxillary endoscopic approach uh, in the, to the trigopalatine fossa, or lateral to the carotid into the infratemporal fossa, as I will show you uh, um, in, in several minutes. For the parapharyngeal space, this is, cannot be accessed through the nose, and we prefer uh, performing uh, transcervical endoscopic or TORS, transoral robotic surgery. There are two corridors to, for transnasal endoscopic approach the superior corridor in red and the inferior corridor in green. This is a, a, an access and transnasal approach that we use to perform for removal of a juvenile angiofibroma, in this case, that encompass the infratemporal retromaxillary pterygopalatine fossa. But nowadays, this is very rare. You can see here the endoscopic approach. This is the pterygopalatine, this is the pterygopalatine fossa. So this is the uh, wall of the, the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus, sorry. And you can see here the uh, internal maxillary artery and a clip that was placed at the trigopalatine, uh, uh, at the internal maxillary artery, which uh, contributed uh, the blood supply to the tumor. The tumor is too big for remove, to be removed through the nose, so it is removed through the mouth, uh, uh, through the quana, as can be seen here, uh, and block and complete removal of the tumor. The superior, uh, the superior uh, corridor involves the uh, exposure of the maxillary sinus through a Dunker's uh, approach, as I showed you before, which is again removal of the anterior wall of the maxillary sinus, and then the maxillary sinus is removed either with a drill. Sorry. Sorry, either with a drill or with a carison, 
uh, as I, uh, I show you before, and then exposing the internal maxillary artery. And you can see here uh, from the Roton um, chapter in our book, the anatomy of the internal maxillary artery and the uh, posterior, uh, uh, and the area posteriorly to the uh, maxillary sinus. You can see here the maxillary sinus at, on the left side when you removed the bone of the maxillary sinus, all the neurovascular um, apparatus is exposed and uh, can be uh, accessed with uh, surgical tools and what determines the uh, surgical approach here and the surgical extension of the approach is the space created by the tumor. How do we identify the uh, internal uh, carotid artery? The internal carotid artery is easily, and the best way to identify it is through the video nerve and sphenopalatine artery. The video nerve actually, as you can see here, go, goes posteriorly into the, uh, into the uh, area of the internal carotid artery, as you can see here through the video nerve. This is the video nerve, okay? So you can find here the trigopalatine artery, find the video nerve, drill from three o'clock to nine o'clock, go posteriorly easily with the drill, and then with the help of a Doppler, endoscopic Doppler, you can find the internal carotid artery and continue the surgery from there. This is a, a, a picture showing you the uh, access to the uh, PPF, the pterygopalatine fossa. This is the uh, medial pterygoid plate. The lateral pterygoid plate was removed. The uh, fossa of the uh, posterior wall of the maxillary sinus was removed. And you can see here a nice access to the infratemporal fossa. Again, coana, crib reform plate, medial pterygoid, lateral pterygoid, his was removed, and this is the posterior, the area posterior to the uh, maxillary sinus. And this is where we are in the navigation, removing the tumor. We can go intracranially, as you can see here, and go and, and, and intracranially, lateral and medial to the carotid artery, this is the uh, sphenoid sinus. This is the posterior area of the crib reform plate. This is the planum, through the planum removal of the tumor. Further exposure. This is the, uh, um, the tumor is slowly peeled and removed from the brain parenchyme. And you can see here the brain, this is the internal carotid artery, medial and lateral. This is the optic chiasm and optic nerve and the acorn is shown here. So you can go with the tumor determines your approach in this case into lateral and medial intracranially to the internal carotid artery. And this is after the reconstruction. We have dedicated a, a, an issue of the operative techniques in otolaryngology head and neck surgery to uh, surgical approaches to the parapharynx, nasopharynx, and uh, infratemporal fossa. And in this uh, issue, we first describe the approach uh, with the uh, Da Vinci, and the evolution of it was first, uh, you can see here for small tumors of the Parapharyngeal space. Uh, this can the removal of the tumor can be done endoscopically, as I will show you soon, and it can be combined with the trans, a trans uh, oral or a robotic surgery. For example, 
You all know, and you're familiar with the techniques for removal of this type of tumor. Usually they necessitate finger dissection, transcervical finger dissection, and therefore sometimes the tumor will re be removed uh, as a whole and block without spillage, and sometimes because the tumor is very big and under a lot of pressure, and there's area of, of that it can break, and therefore the tumor may uh, break and spill. And in this case, if it's a pleomorphic adenoma, this is a 100% recurrency due to spillage of the tumor. At first, for these big tumors, we approach them with a trans-oral robotic as shown here. This is a, a hockey stick incision. This is the ovula, this is the palate, this is the tubus. Here you can see the epiglottis. Uh, elevated of the flap using a standard technique as every one of you uses for a, a standard a, a head and neck surgery. We elevate the flap, we expose the tumor, and then through a neck incision, we can uh, uh, push the tumor from the neck outside and remove it as a whole through the mouth. So this was the first evolution of the uh, technique for combined transcervical open and robotic transoral. And you can see here the total removal of the tumor. Later on, for this tumor, for, uh, such as this tumor, for, as, uh, uh, which is a carcinoma, explomorphic adenoma, we started to perform endoscopic transcervical and transoral robotic. First, we would start with endoscopic, sorry, with endoscopic uh, transcervical uh, approach. If the tumor can be removed solely through the neck, that will complete surgery. If the tumor is too big, we will combine it with a robotic approach. And therefore, we always ready for big tumors to perform a, a robotic surgery as well as Transcervical. So you see here the technique. This is endoscope through the uh, through the neck using a banana retractor. We can create the space. We identify the tumor using standard endoscopic techniques with uh, blunt scissors, suctions, free air. We remove the tumor from its surrounding. You see here the, the uh, retractors, you can see here the hypoglossal nerve, the lingual nerve, here the, uh, here you could see the, um, the uh, pterygoid muscle. And then if the tumor is too big to be removed from the neck, as in this case, we would start the standard technique with the uh, transoral robotic, very intuitive, elevated over the flap. Here, there was a, sorry for that. The tumor involved the, uh, the one second. I hope it didn't crash. I will restart the program. Okay, so again, this is completing the endoscopic transcervical approach, and this is the transoral approach. The tumor involved the mucosa because the patient had previously 
uh, here you can see the involvement of the mucosa because he had transoral biopsy in another institution. So we can also remove a cuff of mucosa in order to reach complete margins, uh, negative margins. You can see here nicely the mucosa is removed. You can see the area of the tumor that was uh, violated because of the trans uh, oral biopsy. If we would perform such a surgery uh, solely transcervical, we will have 100% spillage of the tumor uh, through the neck. And this is removal of this big tumor through a combined transcervical and transoral robotic approach, and the tumor is removed completely, including negative margin from the mucosa that was involved. This is the area of the mucosa that was involved uh, because of the previous biopsy, and this is the tumor. You can see here before surgery and after surgery. Again, you can see here before, this is another case of carcinoma, extromorphic adenoma. You can see here the configuration of the tumor that goes uh, anteriorly uh, to the mucosa. Uh, these are very uh, risky to remove using a finger dissection. As you know, sometimes it, it, it spills, sometimes not. Depends on the experience of the surgeon and the size of his fingers and the extent of his, his fingers, obviously. And therefore, through an endoscopic approach is much easier and in my opinion, safer to remove the tumor uh, meticulously without uh, spillage. And we achieved complete in, in, in 15 cases that we've done in the last uh, 10 years, uh, we hadn't, uh, we didn't have a single spillage of these tumors. You can see here again, before surgery, after surgery, and in this case, again, before and after surgery. And these are the, the, the tumors, including the sizes of the tumors that were uh, removed. Also, very interestingly, sometimes very rarely you can find these type of uh, uh, findings. This is a patient with papillary uh, carcinoma of the thyroid with the suspected lymph node, positive thyroglobulin, failed for uh, radioactive iodine, and uh, this is a very high lymph node. How would you approach this lymph node surgically uh, without an endoscope? Very difficult to do, maybe through a transmandibular approach. Through the necks, it's very hard to see small tumors in this area. And in order to remove that very easily and safely can be performed with an endoscopic approach, Bear in mind that the carotid artery is closed, but the carotid artery is identified low in the neck, and then endoscopically, you can follow the carotid artery until you identify the node, and you can remove this node completely uh, with surgery, and that prevents any other modality, including radiation, and everything else is not needed in this case. So just for summary, I'm also uh, uh, I, I'm, 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 my time is almost completely uh, off. Uh, so uh, summary, tips and pearls. Radiological and pathological workup should be combined. They should agree with each other. And in any case, if there's, there's this disagreement between pathology and radiology and clinics, we need to reevaluate the possibility that one of them is wrong. Know the indication, the contraindication, and define the goal of surgery before surgery is done. Always removal of the tumor is not the goal of surgery. Goal of surgery could be either cure, total remove, removal with negative margin, extent of uh, lifespan, palliation, and this needs to be defined. Plan your reconstruction. Had I didn't discuss reconstruction in this case because of the sake of time. This is a talk, a totally separate talk about how do we reconstruct uh, these defects, if there's a need for reconstruction at all. 
Uh, wide access is important, combined approaches, and wide access is safer than narrow approaches and, and which are more risky. Know your limits, and if you can, know how to extend the, your limits if this is possible. And thank you very much for your time. I'm opening the, um, for discussion. And again, I'm grateful for your invitation to give the talk in the society and hope to come back uh, for other talks. And also hope to see you in Israel uh, very soon uh, in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zev, for the excellent presentation and uh, uh, telling all the uh, difficulties and uh, the advantages of uh, the endoscopic. Uh, I have one small uh, question or uh, your uh, opinion on that matter. Uh, we do quite a lot of uh, angiofibromas, which are uh, extended uh, into the infratemporal fossa. And uh, uh, I had been uh, doing this uh, um, with basically uh, three approaches, uh, the endoscopic or the midfacial degloving, and the third one, the maxillary swing. Uh, I somehow find that maxillary swing is a very good approach in a sense that uh, uh, the work that you probably would require in to do in the endoscopic would would uh, entail a lot of removal of the bones just for the approach, uh, which uh, in swing quicker and it just saves that part of the section which would otherwise be required in endoscopic. What is your view on on the maxillary swing vis-a-vis -vis the endoscopic approach uh, when the tumor is in the infratemporal fossa. Would you, would you don't, you, you, will, you will never do maxillary swing or uh, uh, you will still do maxillary swing in some? These are very difficult uh, operations. For large JNAs which go into the infratemporal fossa, these are very risky and very difficult surgeries. And you, I would prefer the surgical approach which I feel safer in my hands because the goal is to take the tumor and that there will, no, will be no catastrophe. So what is safer, for in your hands, this is the right way to go. If it's a big, if it's obviously if the small JNAs that are fed by the uh, internal maxillary arteries and mainly encompass the, paranasal, the, 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 the nasal sinuses, maybe goes posterior to the perigopalatine fossa a little bit, these can be removed very easily with uh, an endoscopic probe. If it's very big ones going laterally and you need a combined approach, uh, so it's obviously, if you go in for temporal fossa, that's determined it's an open approach. Uh, I would prefer to perform an open approach as a whole through, you know, infratemporal fossa and maxillary swing rather than go uh, partially endoscopic, partially uh, open. Uh, I never had to do, I never did uh, partially open, partially endoscopic. Uh, so I prefer to go one uh, uh, one way one. or another, either an, an, an endoscopic, rather smaller, easier to control, or fully open, stay safer. I will be, I will feel safer, and I would agree with you. This is a better approach for these complex uh, highly vascular tunnels. So uh, what, what is, uh, uh, which laterality, how much laterality would you, uh, would, would you draw the mid pupillary line and um, uh, later to that uh, you would go in for the open or? Um, if it goes, if it goes to the infratemporal fossa, then I would uh, prefer a combined approach. Uh, for large, 
GNAs uh, that will that will involve the maxillary sinus or posterior directly posterior to the maxillary sinus, not going laterally out and up from the maxillary and posterior pericopalatine fossa. These which are limited, I would I would in general I would say. Um, the lateral pterygoid plates, a little bit more than that, and that's it. Uh, if it goes far centimeters above and lateral to the lateral pterygoid plate, it has to be combined with an open approach laterally, so I would not do these two moles solely endoscopically. Thank you. Great presentation, uh, Professor Gill. And uh, I especially you. congratulate you for the fact that your talk did not limit, it, limit itself to ITF. Uh, you went into the realm of endoscopic skull base surgery in general. I believe it will be of immense benefit to the young trainee surgeons who are looking for a career in that. Also touched a little bit upon parapharyngeal space. Uh, I remember during uh, my times as a fellow, the international collaborative study on skull base resections, the open cranial facial resections came out. And uh, that was, uh, again, from all of our program directors, I think Dr. Shah in your case and Dr. Donald in my case. And we realized that even though, uh, also in light of our excellent talk last week, we know that there are specific indications for open craniofacial resections. But I think in the correct stage and the correct histology, endoscopic is definitely a good option. And I think literature, which needs to be more mature, will probably pave the way. I had a couple of questions about uh, the robotic slash endoscopic approaches to the parapharyngeal space. Again. Nice demonstrations. My first question pertains to transnasal robotic surgery. Uh, we at our center have done two salvage nasopharyngectomies. I understand that most of the indications of transnasal robotic surgery, however little have been extrapolated from Southeast Asia, have come in the setting of central skull-based disease like nasopharyngeal recurrence post chemo radiation. Uh, what's your take on robotic for ITF, especially transnasally? And the second question is, uh, in light of your uh, presentation on the parapharyngeal space, is there any anatomical radiological limit where you decide how you have to counsel the patient about a combined trans uh, oral trans cervical approach? Is the base of styloid? We follow the base of styloid as a landmark where we probably tell them that we might need a trans oral incision as well. Uh, what's your take on that? So these two questions. Uh, we. Um... We don't practice transnasal robotic surgery. Uh, I have no experience. Maybe it's an excellent way. Uh, the reason that we don't do that is because we feel uh, secure enough to remove uh, any tumor which is indicated for surgery, usually recurrent nasopharyngeal, endoscopically. Uh, also removal and also do the reconstruction, which is very important in these patients because of the, the radiation and, and other mobilities that they have. So uh, because endoscopically, it's such an, a, a relatively a straightforward approach, we would, and because we are more um, um, slick with endoscopic transnasal, traditional endoscopic transnasal relative to robotics transnasal, which we didn't have experience or any chance to do this. So we don't do that. So I cannot comment for that. I know about the paper that came uh, from Andy Anderson doing uh, cadaver dissections. We have uh, on us paper. Uh, but, uh, but and this is for the first question. The, the, the second question is um, usually if it's a small, straightforward parapharyngeal space or high parapharyngeal space, trigoparatine fossa or infratemporal fossa tumor, which we feel we can re remove through the neck, there's no need for um, no preferral or no informed consent from transoral uh, robotic. But for these huge tumors, which, uh, which probably are not going to be uh, removed through the neck just because of the space, the space of the oral cavity is bigger than the space of the neck. Even when if you remove the stylo styloid process and even if you cut the posterior belly of the digastric, and even if you remove the submandibular gland and, and all these things, the relatively 
as all of you which are very familiar with these trans uh, cervical techniques are hard to be removed and therefore we are ready with robotic surgery if it can be if it we we feel that we cannot remove it safely and meaning safely is without spillage through the neck then 20 minutes elevated or flap through the mouth and the tumor is removed for, uh, uh, from both sides going through from the neck and from, from the mouth. So any, uh, in, uh, any concern that this is a too big tumor, we will consent for transoral robotics. Great, and I especially congratulate you on your work with your series of carcinoma and sclerotic adenomas. Again, difficult histology to treat, the fact that you're able to do it minimally invasive way in 15 patients really speaks volumes for the experience that your team has gathered. Congratulations, and if there are any other questions, uh, we'd be glad to moderate. Shamit, uh, can I interject? Deepak here. Of course, Deepak, go ahead. Uh, Ziv, um, let's say you have a, a, a retromaxillary tumor or an SCC that has involved the maxilla and extending posteriorly, and uh, through the foramen ovale going intracranially, uh, is there any option of resecting this through a minimally invasive approach? It's all transmedial. Uh, there's no pterygoid involvement, um, pterygoid muscle involvement. It's only a perineural spread that is going to the MCF. So would you consider an SCC that is maxilla, retromaxilla, pterygopalatine fusa, and intracranial? Uh, I mean, we're looking at only the subtranial approaches that we're looking at. Would you consider that uh, for a minimally invasive approach? I mean, every other tumor is encapsulated, but SCC generally is not. Would you fit your entire thing for an SCC? Yeah, the, the tumor is removed piecemeal uh, in endoscopic okay. approach. And uh, as you okay. know, also when you do a, an open approach, the removal is usually piecemeal removal, only if it's a very hard tumor, which can be manipulated uh, and, re, and, and it can be removed and blocked. Sometimes just because it's safer, it needs to be removed in two parts, three parts or piecemeal because you don't have control of what's behind the tumor. So you have to go part by part, small piece by small piece until you get the control on the vessel, which usually are be behind the, the tumor. So, so we're talking about piecemeal or parts. Usually it will be uh, in several parts or piecemeal. So there's no difference in that. Now for adenoid cystic carcinoma, if you can see that the foramen ovale is involved, so it's obvious that the cavernous sinus is involved because microscopically the tumor is, in, is already in the cavernous sinus. So yeah. the goal of surgery here is to remove most of the tumor, uh, reach the foramen ovale, remove the nerve from the foramen ovale, and all of these can be done endoscopically. And cavernous sinus, is too risky to get an into, into surgery through the nose or even through an open approach. And therefore we will, uh, we will uh, send the patient for adjuvant radiation treatment specifically into the cavernous sinus and of all the margins. Hopefully that, and it was shown before that it can control, um, control locally the tumor about uh, the, the, the role of radiation therapy, adjuvant radiation therapy in a dead on cystic carcinoma for increased overall survival. This is questionable. There's no hard data for that. Uh, so I see, I feel that endoscopically, look at the anatomical landmark and com comparing uh, my, my experience as an open skull based surgeon, an endoscopic skull based surgeon, I can follow the nerves the arteries and the anatomical landmarks much safer and better using an endoscopic approach. I see better my pace of surgery. The, 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 the pace of surgery is slower. I have more control of blood. I have less um, uh, need for urgent maneuvers, which sometimes I have 
with an open approach because there's a lot of blood and because you don't see the details microscopically very well. So for specifically these cases, ad uh, adenoid carcinoma involving the foramen ovale, involving the foramen rotundum, we had the, the case like this uh, of, a, of a, a patient which had a positive, sorry, he had, rec he had uh, endoscopic resection of adenoid cyst carcinoma and recurrency in the infraorbital nerve up into the skull base and we removed the infraorbital nerve endoscopically uh, meticulously, very easily, until we removed all the nerve, and then we send it to pathology, see if all the nerves are involved, or only part of the nerve, and then decide of the adjuvant treatment. So, answering your question, uh, in my experience, I would prefer endoscopic resection for these types of tumors. Thanks. Uh, one last question, sorry, before I interject on the time. Uh, if you follow the nerve up and you know the nerve is involved because of the thickening of the nerve and widening of the foramen um, for an adenoid cystic. I'm not talking about any other pathology. For adenoid cystic, would you uh, have Beckel scale and everything resected? Or would you say that this is the end of the resection? Let's give radiation after this. Uh, do you see any benefit of going MCF resection or would you just stop there and give adjuvant treatment? I think if the Meckel caves is involved, there's not going to be a negative margins. And we know that for adenoid cystic carcinoma, the most important uh, factor for prognosis is negative margins. And in the case, if we don't going to reach a negative margin, so doing more surgery, which is much riskier, which is much can inflict much more morbidity. I don't see the need and any any uh, any sense of uh, doing that because it's going to be the same thing. It's going to be positive margin anyway. So I rather have positive margins less morbidity than positive margin more morbidity. And I will leave uh, the rest of I leave my my uh, uh, oncology colleagues to do to give the adjuvant treatment in these cases. So thank you, Zeb. It was a wonderful uh, talk. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Deepak. Great perspectives on the on the tumors that we see. Uh, thanks to questions by Deepak and, and answered uh, adequately. I actually have uh, questions which are extensions of the same. Uh, let's look at Deepak's tumor number one, retromaxilla involving medial ITF and only stopping at the level of foramen ovale. Uh, in your experience, uh, Professor Gill, would you ever consider a so-called cranioendoscopic approach? in which your neurosurgeons or you yourself would do a small subtemporal craniotomy, especially if the foramen was widened and clear it from there and do the rest of it endoscopically, like you said. And- Excellent have, question, Shaman. Excellent question. Excellent question. So we'll, we'll oh, probably get we, an answer to that and then we'll ask you this question. Yes, please go ahead. No, I, 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 we would prefer, we were more traditional. We would do a standard craniotomy lateral Terrional craniotomy and do standard uh, dissection, not to a keyhole or endoscopically. But uh, maybe this is the future. We just our neurosurgical colleagues are not not specialized in this. So I've no, I've, 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 I I usually use traditional uh, approaches neurosurgically. And no, great. And I think we we all endorse that point. And maybe like you said, it is something that we need to look at for select patients. Again, the kind of patient that you get would be probably once in a few months only. But then regarding the second of Deepak's patients, if you had preoperative manifest uh, foramen rotundum uh, involvement and maxillary nerve thickening that was apparent on MR, and the only thing you had was foraminal thickening and it was extradural disease, would you upfront plan a middle cranial fossa resection so that you can see the Gasserian ganglion, which to my understanding and to my expertise is only possible by an open approach, or would you still go endoscopic and stop at the skull base like we initially talked about? It's an excellent question. So again, the question, the, 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 in my vision, the question is what is the balance between morbidity and uh, an, 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 an extension yeah. Uh, of uh, surgery to reach negative margins. If I feel 
that I can reach negative margin, I will use a combined approach and do any effort in order to, in, and reject the Gazerian ganglion in order to get, receive negative margin. However, if the Gazerian ganglion, if, if there's macroscopic tumor at the foramen ovale and foramen rotundum, it's obvious that there is a disease in the cavernous sinus because we are talking microscopically. The tumor is far more proximal than the, the foramen ovale and foramen rotundum. It's, it's in the cavernous sinus. And therefore, in my opinion, if there's a tumor macroscopically that you can see in MRI involving the Meckel cave, involving the uh, V1, V2, or V3, therefore, the chance of reaching negative margins is almost non-existent and therefore I will use most of the time in these cases I will use endoscopic resection, I will stop before the gazenial ganglion and I will continue with a radiation therapy because if it's going to be negative, if it's going to be positive margin, it doesn't matter if it's positive one millimeter more or three millimeter less, it's going to be positive and it's going to reoccur in the cavernous sinus and I cannot control the disease in the cavernous sinus surgically in adenoid cystic carcinoma and in squamous cell carcinoma. And therefore, this is the limit of my surgery in this case. Thank you. And I think that uh, there are so many senior surgeons in this group who's been, who've benefited from your surgical pearls. Uh, are there any other questions from any other members of the audience? Okay. I have a question. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah, Ziv, Ziv, do you ever have to split the mandible for a paraphyngeal space tumor? Like we have a very low threshold in splitting the mandible because we get tumors which are say six or seven centimeters in size. So with your combined approach, trans cervical and trans robotic, do you ever have to split the mandible? Uh, you're talking about paraphyngeal space, which abutting the mandible, the, the middle uh, uh, face of the mandible, or even mildly, mildly erodes it, right? This is what you're talking about? Oh, for, a, for a benign tumor, benign paraphernal space like a pleomorphic. Okay, benign. Uh, if, and the question is whether I, I had to what? To strip the tumor from the no, mandible? No, no, no. The, do you have to split the mandible? Do you have to ah, do to a mandible? Or mandible. Me? Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, no, never needed to split the mandible. I last time I split the mandible was twelve years ago. So transoral robotics. Uh, the only the... only reason to split the mandible if there's a um, involvement of the mandible by a malignant tumor. Okay. Thanks. Sir. Any other questions? Great. If there are none more, uh, I'll request uh, Dr. Vipin. Thank you, everyone, for a wonderful session. Thank you, AY Delhi. And Professor Vipin, I request you for the closing comments. And we've had wonderful two sessions. And uh, especially today, I learned a lot myself. Thank you so much. Yeah, th thanks, Zev. We had a wonderful session today. And uh, I was just looking at uh, YouTube views for the last lecture. And we have crossed 4,500 uh, just in a week. So I expect more to come in the coming uh, weeks. So uh, we have an action-packed uh, month of April. We are going to have uh, uh, three lectures uh, and panel discussions in the month of April. On 9th of uh, April, we have a lecture by Professor Nitin M. Nagarkar on uh, uh, management of parotid tumors and the tips and tricks, followed by a panel discussion, which will be moderated by uh, uh, Dr. Uh, on 16th, we have uh, another interesting topic, management of primary hyperparathyroidism. And we have uh, Dr. Garima Agarwal from University of Alabama. Uh, she will be uh, talking on management, followed by a uh, panel discussion by Dr. Deepak Sarin. And on 30th, we have an interesting session on uh, Seattle endoscopy. Uh, which will be able to two talks lined up on 30th of April. The first one is uh, by P. Singh, and he'll be talking about the paradigm shift that has happened uh, uh, because the advent of the cell endoscopy 
in the management of uh, calculus and other benign uh, uh, diseases like stricture uh, in the parotid glands. And followed by a lecture by uh, Professor Rahmatullah Vais Ramati from Harvard Medical School. So we have an interesting lineup uh, uh, coming uh, uh, April and I would invite all of you to uh, join this. And uh, for the non-members of AOI, I invite all the non-members who are eligible to be members to be a member of AOI Delhi. And uh, AOI is certainly there to help you achieve your academic goals by, uh, by the academic activities uh, that, are, that happens throughout the year. So after the month of April, we are going to have a recess for another uh, a couple of months during the month of May and uh, June. And, uh, and after that, we'll meet uh, at the end of uh, July. And uh, with this, uh, uh, if there are any comments by Dr. Taneja? Thank you, Vipin. You are arranging a very good series of lectures by eminent speakers. And these are very helpful and they are bringing in-depth knowledge about these topics. So I think this is a very wonderful effort and it should be continued. And I thank you, Dr. Ziv, for this wonderful presentation. Thank you, Vipin. Thank you very much. Griffin, I'll comments. attend every meet now because this is so high quality. And Ziv has been so uh, unassuming in his sharing of knowledge. And uh, Ziv hasn't been in India for some time now. So hopefully <laughs> we'll get to see him uh, enjoying uh, Gujarati or Punjabi food. So you thank you so much, Vipin. You a, you're a brilliant uh, person. Thank you so much, Vipin. We will be here shortly, very shortly. We are going to have another uh, physical conference, maybe after a gap of two years. So, uh, Zev will be around and you, you'll get to meet him physically in Delhi in the month of December. And with these uh, comments, uh, I thank all the participants. I thank the speaker of today, uh, Professor Ziv Gill, a wonderful person and uh, a wonderful friend. And... Uh, He's an, he's an author, an entrepreneur, a surgeon, a scientist. He's a multifaceted personality in that way. And uh, uh, thanks for holding uh, the hosting the Indian as well as Israeli flag also. And with these comments, uh, I thank you all. And uh, if there are no further comments, we can close this session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vipin. Thank you so much.